Hey, everybody, today we are talking to Yonatan, who is the founder of Healthy.io. I'm sure that many of you watching will know Healthy.io. Um, they've got this very unique FDA cleared device which can scan urine tests that are done at home. Um, and that has already helped millions of Americans, about half a million people in the UK, uh, and goes a long way to helping people avoid dialysis and stay on top of their kidney function. Um, they've also got uh, an application in wound care. So they're using this um, like AI color vision technology in order to help with wound care too. And that's saving loads of lives and preventing amputations and all that sort of stuff. Um, but Yelatan is a fascinating guy. He was a diplomatic advisor to the president of Israel. So his job was flying around to the likes of Barack Obama, even the likes of Putin and talking to about healthcare. And one thing that Yelatan talks about is the fact that healthcare is this kind of constant across all nations about what everybody wants to do. And it's kind of personal for people, like even where it's not necessarily one of those political uh, levers to pull, it does seem to be something that world leaders do actually want to solve personally as well, which is really interesting. That's what led him to you know, being an entrepreneur in healthcare and all that kind of stuff. Um, fascinating guy, incredible stories, healthy.io, which I'm sure so many of you know about. He's doing some awesome stuff. So yeah, hope you enjoy this one. So Yonatan, welcome to the Health Tech Podcast. How are you doing, sir? Thanks for having me. Doing great. First rain of the season here in Israel. Autumn started. Uh, starting Excellent. with warmer and rain. Uncommon to Israel, but uh, yeah. I was there a couple of years ago and it was nothing but beautiful sunshine. It was absolutely <laughs> fabulous. Um, so I've definitely got a soft spot. Definitely got a soft spot. Yonatan, listen, absolutely delighted to have you on. Um, obviously, an incredible company that you run and has been around for a long time and has seen its way through some interesting phases of health tech. But you are still standing. You are still thriving. And yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into some of the bits that contribute to that, actually, because I think there are some really, really interesting waves you've not only ridden, but actually kind of, as I say, thrived on. And so I think there's some awesome stuff to cover today. But before we get into the company and what you're up to, let's talk about you. So yeah, why don't you tell us your story? So first of all, thanks for having me. And it's it's always a pleasure. And we, we've had a previous discussion in which, you know, we at the founding team consider uh, being, you know, north of a decade old in an industry that's very nascent, um, consider being able to share the story and talk honestly and frankly about what doesn't work and what does work in the industry as a way to give back to, you know, aspiring entrepreneurs in the industry. This is a tough industry. You have, you know, it's a tough walk uh, through through a number of years. Uh, it involves regulation, it involves others. So it's always um, a pleasure for us to share the story in, in, in a stage and a venue like like uh, you've built um, and hope that, that, you know, we're able to help and contribute to folks, you know, who are either in the business or considering to go in or invest. So, you know, happy, happy to be here and thanks for, for having us. You're very welcome, sir. You're very welcome, sir. So where does your where does your story start then? Were you one of these people that had a business at the age of two and sold something to your yeah. siblings? Or is it uh, are you more of a, <laughs> I did some science at university and thought I'd uh, do some tech transfer? Like, where, where does it begin? I guess, you know, I think, you know, I don't write code. And I'm a atypical founder also here in the Israeli ecosystem in the sense that I didn't have like a solution and was looking for a problem. Uh, on the personal side, I'm the youngest of four boys, um, which I think has been a very much formative experience <laughs> in my life. I'm also a father of four, so I can see that now. I can see my youngest uh, daughter kind of, you know, enjoying the same uh, same dynamics I had as a kid. <laughs> um, my parents are, you know, my father immigrated here from Iran in the late 40s. And, you know, straight into a, like, um, immigrant camp, moved in from Tehran, which is, you know, 4,000 year old city, beautiful, um, affluent into, uh, into a tent for like six years. In the early days of Israel, my mom was born here. Her parents fled from Iraq. They were literal refugees, uh, coming out in the early fifties. 
um, again, a, a 2,500-year-old Jewish community that, that basically evaporated within a number of years. Being an entrepreneur was not something that they had fostered for us. Um, I grew up with a very much with a play it safe narrative, right? Like classic first generation after immigration and, and, and a refugee kind of background. It worked really, really hard for us to, to be able to go to university and kind of play it safe. So that was not in the DNA. And, <clears throat> and, and in many ways, that's how I ran my career. My uh, first episode was significant in public service. So I grew up in public service. I finished and I think culmination of my career in the public side. I was a diplomatic advisor to the president of Israel and subsequently a CTO uh, with um, very, I would say, um, delicate task of serving his vision. He was 86 years old. That's Shimon Peres, a Nobel Prize laureate, you know, founding father of Israel. Uh, was tasked in serving his, I would say, very detailed and 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 long term view around how tech and diplomacy combine. He was one of the first world leaders to kind of think through. Well, technology is great; it's very important for our GDP and for productivity, but it is actually also very important for our ability to make the world a better place via diplomatic ties. So we know how to desalinate. We've been very effective in that. How do we bring that? You know capacity in helping other countries and, and bilateral, multilateral forums. How do we bring our space quality? Uh, uh, you know, this was one of the only nine countries in the world that actually launched satellites into space autonomously and have the capacity. So how do we kind of share our space, you know, capacities with other countries and so on and so forth. So I was 26. I came back from training in the U.S. and and it was um, an incredible journey, the ability to work with uh, a titan, a diplomat of his caliber, an elder statesman back in the day, uh, and serve his vision of, of you know, combining uh, technology and diplomacy together. So that's sort of how my career path um, emerged. And, and as I was working for the president and, you know, flying with him to the White House, to Brazil, to Argentina, seeing kind of what problems the world is dealing with. What are the key areas and topics that heads of state are dealing with, right? Uh, healthcare was front and center, right? Whether you're on the OECD side of things and you have an elderly population and less and less babies born and you have like a quality of life issue for elderly and you want to make sure people live longer and they have the right quality of life and they can contribute to the economy. That's sort of one area. That's where you're busy with cancer and you're busy with dementia and you're busy with like forms of delivering care efficiently, right? NHS versus privatization versus the Israeli model. And if you're in China, then you're dealing with decentralized care, right? Because you're having this magnitude of people starting to get better and better health care. And if you're Africa and if you're other places, there's there's actually still a very high birth rate and you want to be able to account for child mortality and, and you know, children uh, health care and so on and so forth. And if you're Japan, you're busy with 85 to 100 year old type healthcare challenges. But this, this would feature time and time again when we met President Bush and President Obama and President Lula, who is now again President Brazil and Chancellor Merkel, you know, like everywhere we'd go, we'd get the question of, you know, how do you run healthcare? How does Israel have an incredible life expectancy and quality of life with like seven and a half percent of GDP spent on healthcare? You know, how is all of that? You know, that was a feature of like what, what everybody was busy with. And when I realized that this is sort of where countries are, it's a major, you know, societal challenge. And this is where technology is going, right? You started seeing DNA sequencing becoming mega cheap. You started seeing bandwidth becoming mega cheap. You started seeing uh, smartphones that bit on the rise. We're talking 2010, 2011. I realized that this technology and that this area may be opening up to like non-scientists like me and non-coders like me. Right, that that the second decade of the 21st century would actually allow new entrants into healthcare that are not PhDs, that are not you know PhDs in MD PhDs, that are not material science experts, uh, because this industry, uh, for all its trillions of value, was always the playground for clinicians or scientists or people who know how to do drug delivery, right? Pharma, biosynthetics now, and suddenly sort of had an instinct: is this the opening of the industry for people like myself, right? Who understand policy, who understand the problem and, and would try to build technology to solve it as opposed to our MDs, they see a problem and once they solve it, there's a business for it. 
And when I when I left for private uh, sector, um, I spent some time with with different ideas and experiences. And then, you know, sometimes life kind of exposes you to a problem in a way that doesn't leave you. You can sort of be left inactive. You decide that, you know, there's a call to action there. For me, it was, you know, my parents uh, retired early in, in, in that decade and they traveled. They, they loved to travel. Um, they were in China. I remember my oldest brother calling us four, me and my, my other three brothers, on a conference call saying, listen, I got a call from dad. Mom was injured, lost her consciousness. They're in like a smaller scale uh, Chinese city receiving treatment. Um, it's kind of thing. I don't know if you're it is sort of from in our family, it's always like seniority, right? So my dad would always talk about the, the, the most pressing, you know, uh, issues with my oldest brother, and then I'd kind of have it trickle down. So <laughs> this time was not different. Uh, but then we went on a conference call with my dad directly. And I said, listen, he was describing the situation. I said, listen, um, can you take pictures of her CT scans and, and send it my way via email? Um, because in essence, they thought she had broken ribs and wanted to fly her out to Hong Kong to get better treatment. But for my dad, something didn't make sense. He felt it was actually a bit more than broken ribs. As I, you know, was on the team with President Paris, he was when I left, he was already 90, 90 ish. We used to fly with with trauma doctors all the time. So I had on my speed dial quite a number of very top notch trauma doctors. So as soon as I got those those uh, CT scans, I sent them to one of them. Uh, I sent him a few of them and one of them called back like literally immediately said, Hey, who are these pictures of? I said, it's my mom. She just regained consciousness. He said, she has a, um, air in the lungs and she has some, also some, some liquid in the lungs from this trauma. Um, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal, but she needs to, you know, either you or one of your brothers need to fly out there. It's going to take a good week to 10 days before she can fly because there's actually a risk that if she boards a plane without an oxygen mask and, you know, that her lungs can collapse. So the whole idea of flying her to Hong Kong may sound good, not a good idea. And if you want me to talk to the head of that uh, hospital to just or the insurance company to kind of get them to understand it's not a good idea uh, and it can actually threaten her life, then let me know. And I remember hanging up the phone and I, like before I called my dad and my brother's like, is it possible that a smartphone image from the iPhone 4, you know, traveling here over 3G and not even Wi-Fi uh, meets a doctor that I happen to have on my speed dial and would end up in, like saving my mom's life. What happens five years from now when bandwidth is, is infinite for nothing, when cameras are incredible, the iPhone 4 was just a foray there, when computation on the phone, on the cloud, the storage, it's all going to be like amazingly exponential growth and massive decline in price, right? How is healthcare going to look like? Like, is, is this anecdotal? What, what I just kind of experienced, or could this be generalized and scalable? And clearly finished that, you know, priority one. One of my brothers flew out to my mom's, spent a week there. They flew straight to Israel. She's great. I told you I have four kids, so she saw all of them, you know, born and, and is an amazing uh, partner for my wife and I in growing them, in raising them. So I'm very happy, you know, she regained her strength in full. But, you know, as soon as that happened, I was like, you know, I had a bug in my head, right? Like I couldn't... I literally couldn't sleep. I was like, what? Yeah. How is it scalable? And if it's scalable, can it treat big like healthcare phenomena? Or is it or, like, what can we solve if I'm right? And really the vision for Healthy IO was born that day. It was later coined by the economist as the vision, the company who had the vision to introduce the world to the medical selfie. Um, and, and that's ultimately what we kind of endeavored into. I'm happy to share sort of the, the early stages and whatnot, but at the end of the day, Healthy IO today, 10 years, no, 11 years later, owns an incredible pioneering and unique FDA clearance to, to scan urine tests that actually help 60 million Americans avoid dialysis, have helped already in the past uh, half a million people in the UK to gain access to testing and avoid uh, dialysis uh, treatments and, and, and really regain control on, on, on onset uh, kidney degradation. Um, it has built an incredible uh, piece of technology around AI that teaches, it's what we call color AI, right? An engine of growth for the company, computer vision of, of I would say, the most bleeding edge capacity um, that teaches all smartphone cameras to see color the same way in a clinical setting, which is a very hard challenge to, to overcome and um, really 
we've helped save tens of thousands of lives and have helped to, you know, save uh, thousands of, of patients from uh, amputations through our wound care application, specifically also in the UK. So um, I think we've delivered on the, on the medical selfie vision and now we're, we're aiming higher into scale um, and into basically every medical process that is vision-based will end up on the phone. And we are in a very good position to be the company that, that does that time and time and time again. Uh, because as you know, and as you, you know, you've interviewed before on, on the podcast, to deliver scale in healthcare, in health tech, I should say, outside of the molecule space and the synthetic biology space, you got you to gotta operate incredibly well within a sliver of like, you know, space that you have that triangulates regulation policy and payer policy, population health, right? And solving a real clinical need via technology. So you can have a great technology, but if you're not cost effective and affordable, you're not going to get a lot of patients to do that on the policy side and kind of large payers. And you're not going to go through the regulation. If you have regulated, but you're super expensive and your technology is so, so somebody's just going to beat you to it. So you got to excel at all three. This is not one of those where you get two out of three. And so I'm very happy and proud that we were able to do that already twice and kind of build a company that, as you said in your in your opening remarks, is is more than a decade old, had seen Theranos collapse and the entire industry collapse with it. Uh, we'd seen, you know, intensive capital invested in the in the industry between 14 and 16, just evaporating when Google decided to close its Google Health and kind of gave up on the AI will replace the doctor. I hope I can say that bullshit vision that everybody was pushing in that at that time. And so the wearable stuff um, and, and also go through, you know, a horrible, I would say, last 18 months, given companies in health tech that IPO'd in the bubble, or I should say throughout COVID and have been eradicated in the public market, uh, which is now totally redefining the, ro- the, the rules on how to raise capital. What's a meaningful company? How does a company scale? Um, and so I think we've been able to successfully, you know, weather these storms and prosper, um, because we were just very, very focused on those two things and on patients. Um, and again, happy to, to expand, uh, in ways that, that, that drive most value to, to you and, and mm. to the listeners. Thank you. Um, a lovely story. And actually I, I like the, there's a threat, the thread of your parents running through that from the risks and danger frankly that they faced in order to set up the conditions for you to thrive and this interesting concept of a playing it safe mentality as well i think for for parents that have obviously gone through that amount of frankly trauma you know as a refugee fleeing from iraq and of course they want safety for their family of course they have that framework that they want to bring up the next generation into of course they don't want risk of course of course that's going to be natural and i think it's interesting to me how you kind of took that play it safe mentality let's go and get a job and sort of got the best job (laughs) you sort of you sort of completed that you sort of went as high as you can possibly go within the employed world or at least that policy sector of the employed world um as a diplomatic advisor to the president and you know you you gloss over it you know very humbly you know meeting various world leaders and things like that but that playing it safe mentality that you're instilled with i was actually instilled with a similar mentality myself and i think the bar that you end up having for what a good idea is in entrepreneurship is incredibly high and okay, it's an N equals one study again, or perhaps N equals two study here. But the point is I can relate to having an incredibly high bar for what a good idea is because all of your risky ideas are called terrible for various reasons. Then, for, you know, from my perspective, going into medicine and clinical where everything's evidence-based, every, every idea that's new is terrible for various reasons. You're trained as clinicians to find problems in things. So you always find problems in your own ideas first, let alone then opening up to everyone else. So you end up with, as I say, this incredibly high bar for a good idea. But you've obviously had that idea too. And you've then, with it being such a high bar, it has been an incredible idea. And you have 
had the intuition to appreciate what's going to go on publicly, what's going to go on in the tech world, what's going to go on in the healthcare world. And actually that intuition is important to see where the world might go, to see with whether this idea is going to sit into the world that's being created in front of us. And so that intuition piece, I think, is an important piece for you as well. But before I launch into that, I guess for my own interest here, meeting those world leaders and going on those journeys to talk about healthcare with them. What did that teach you in terms of perspective and I guess how the world looks at healthcare? I mean, you mentioned it briefly that people were asking a lot of Israel's ability to spend only seven and a half percent of GDP on healthcare yet have such high life expectancy and people obviously wanting to learn from you with that. But I'm interested more broadly, I guess, of what did that time teach you about globally what the hell are we doing with healthcare? Because it, in a world and at a time where healthcare is spiraling out of cost control and our ability to deliver, particularly publicly, um, <laughs> private healthcare markets being silly for lots of other reasons and world leaders talking about that in front of you. I'm incredibly interested in what, what perspective that gave you and what you wanted to achieve. Yeah, so I think maybe maybe to track back on one important thing that you raised, and then I'll I'll, I'll address the, the the head of state experience, and you know that that fueled my my uh, belief that that's where I should go as a as an entrepreneur, right? Uh, a lot of Israelis end up in cyberspace and in SaaS and enterprise. Amazing companies were born in Israel in that space. I think you're 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 raising an important point on uh, the bar for success, given that you're not a techie and you're not right that you're not like from a uh, space of like building tech. I think what I've learned, and this is thanks to my life partner, to my wife, who's who's been an incredible partner for this journey as well as building the family, is high. I had a very high bar for celebration, which is not the right way to build a company, right? When I went out with the idea on the road show, so many people in 2013 said, no, 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 FDA grade selfies, forget it, right? We know selfies, if you want to build like a gaming company around that, we'll invest, we like you. We know FDA, but that requires the hardware, so forget it, right? And then so many no's, and I got a yes, and I got a term sheet, and then I got it, like every time I came back home, I, you know, I, we had a baby back then. She, she's now 11 and a half years old, but... It has three siblings, but my wife would say, I would say, this is what happened today. We have a term sheet or this or that. And she said, can we celebrate? I said, nah, you know, term sheets, who knows? They might be. Uh... And it was like time. And I remember when the day that, that I got the seed money in the bank account, so $600,000 out of a 3 million seed went in the bank account. And I remember like arriving home and I was like, yeah, the seed came in. And, and she said, can we celebrate? And I said, no, you know, now I need to find engineers and I don't write code myself. And she's like, she literally, she literally held me like this, James, and said, listen, let me tell you this and don't get it the wrong way. You know, statistics has it, you're going to fail in the long term, right? Like one in a thousand succeeds and in healthcare, it's like beyond. And, you know, and I'm with you kind of understanding that this is most probably will fail. So just promise me one thing that you as a person and we as a couple are not going to depend on sort of the tail end of this. Is it going to be an IPO that every small step on the way, every patient, you know, you're, if you're even able to get the patients and you're able to get to the, like every mile celebrate it because it is important mm -hmm. not to depend at the tail end. And so that I had a very high bar for celebrations and I liked how you put it like a high bar for the idea. I would kind of reciprocate. I think one of my problems as an entrepreneur in the early days was to give up on that play it safe, look for the next challenge kind of attitude and reduce the bar for success celebration. Um, and that was very, very, I would say, dramatically impacted our ability to be resilient through a failed FDA trial in 16, through Theranos and all of that kind of stuff to say, well, we've had all these successes before. We're failing this one. Let's go back to the drawing board. We'll get to success again. But success does not necessarily mean do we sell the company? Do we IPO the company? Da, da, da. Success means we got 100,000 patients. Great. The idea was worth it. The journey was worth it. We managed to get the FDA to, to kind of converse with us around AI and the underpinnings of safety around AI in healthcare. Great. Now, a lot of other companies are going to enjoy that as well, right? Like celebrate those points along the way that the lower bar for success celebration, I think is a critical piece. So thanks for kind of framing that. Uh, um, um, I think there's something there. Going back to your question around heads of state. So I think, you know, one of the things that, that 
Um, if I kind of look order of magnitude, I met about 60 heads of state during that, those thousand plus days of me being actively involved on, on, on that, uh, on the, in that arena, there were themes that were very specific for every head of state healthcare cut across, right? There was no talk with the head of state that in which healthcare was not part of, right? Uh, and to your point, like also an Israel angle, like how do you guys deliver? That's one, but just top of mind of healthcare. Right, it's such an like healthcare, education, and infrastructure are three things that are really intractable for politicians today. And like this was 2010. Today it's a thousand x harder because of Twitter and the public debate and the NIMBYs and all of that. Right? Mm. These aren't because there's unions and it's a hard question and you know involves super super hard moral questions from leadership perspective. Like for instance, in Israel we have something that's called the medical basket, like what gets funded via public funding, right? It's all publicly paid in Israel. We all pay taxes and, and fund the system. And then everybody buys whatever private insurance if they want to kind of for a layer or whatever. But like every year a committee needs to meet and say, well, you know, give an example, immuno-oncology drug that just got through the FDA, is it funded or not? How many cases do we have? How many people are going to die if we don't? How many lives are going to be lost? How many, you know, years of quality of life? Like, these are hard decisions for policymakers, right? So this is like, what I took from those meetings is, you know, these are tough, intractable problems, very tough. And they're top of mind. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, that's where you want to be. Tough problem meets, meets top of mind and a lot of money spent means if you solve, the market is already there. You don't need to educate, you don't need to build. So I think that was my main takeaway, right? Um, um, infrastructure, you know, roads, this, that, fine. Like it's, it's, it's doable. It's a matter of, of, do you have the money or not? Healthcare is just intractable. It was intractable for president Obama as it was intractable for president Bush, as it was for Gordon Brown, as it was for, uh, Merkel. And for me, that's interesting. These are very powerful people that wield yeah. 15, 20 billion, 20 trillion dollar economies, right? The U S Germany, UK at three and still healthcare is intractable. Can I ask you why you think that is? Was that an intrinsic motivation that they had, that they wanted from almost like a personal perspective because they are human, yeah. they felt that empathy towards other humans? Do you think it was something broader than that? Or would that vary per person? Like, it's interesting to me that you say it cut across almost, if not everyone. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting because... Mm -hmm. The political levers can be all over the place and, and the where you're getting pushed and pulled, you, you know, you're looking for votes, you're looking for party alignment, you're looking for this, not the other. that that can come and yeah. go. But the fact that it cuts across yeah. everyone is interesting to me, either because it's interesting to everyone from a votes perspective, or perhaps it's interesting mm -hmm. to everyone from a personal perspective. So di did it get personal at that level? I'm interested. This is a kind of a tangent on entrepreneurship, but I'll, I'll say the following. On my journey, you know, I got to meet different types of heads of state, right? Mm. Um, from Africa, from Latin America. We had a good number of meetings with President Putin back in the day. Um, so different types of, 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 you know, President Nazarbayev, Kazakhstan, right? Like different parts of the world and different types of wielding authority. Some had elections and some didn't. Some had elections and some didn't, right? I would say something that may sound counterintuitive for a democratically elected leader to engage with healthcare reform is counterproductive from a political perspective, right? Counterproductive. Okay. Your odds of in a short, call it three to four yeah. year term, Cycle, doing yeah. something meaningful, you can go back and, and, and without political diatribe to go back to the voting kind of ranks and say, here, I did that for, you know, the Obamacare thing, it started here, it ended there, right? Like, mm. it's actually a political dynamite, right? It's not something you want to deal yeah. with politically. Actually, uh, back in the day, Xi Jinping did a far better job at, at, at and, you know, the, the, the leadership in Qatar, in the UAE, did a far better job than the leadership in Western Europe, right? So, you know, I think from, from a voter perspective, you're actually disincentivized to engage in healthcare reform. So that's, you know, that's a sad truth, but that's, that's the way it is. That said, on a human level, President Putin included, right, back in the day, they were all trying to figure it out. Because as a human, they have their own life expectancy. 
right? Yeah. Like the odds of solving for, you know, the odds of solving for cancer are, are, are truly global interest, right? Um, in, during COVID, right? The odds of us being able to solve for COVID, to be the first nation in the world that vaccinated, to be the first nation in the world to have the digital registry, the, it, it's, it's, it affects me as like, I'm the head of state, but I'm also, I want to live <laughs> and my wife and my kids and my family. Whatever. So there is a human element here that, that I agree with you is very much intact, put makes it head of, head of kind of top of mind. But, for, and this is, this is kind of goes against the fact that politically in a democratically elected uh, system, you actually have disincentives to reform the system in any meaningful way. And what happens and what ends up happening uh, and that happened in the NHS a number of times. It happens in, in other countries, in, in France um, and, and Germany and others. You get to a, a type of political reform or political activity that is not only just not efficient, it actually ends up costing more. Yeah. Because the kind of thing you can get through the political process gets headlines, healthcare, blah, 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 but in the end of the day, it actually made things worse. Because, like, think about just NHS delivery. There have been so many reforms in NHS in the last exactly. seven years, all with good hopes. Yeah. But on our side, and you, you felt it like every like nine to ten months. Oh, there's an uh, there's uh, there's the ICAs, there's the CCG. Yeah. Uh. So the people on the ground actually get disincentivized to align. In, in many ways, it's either really reform it or let it be. <laughs> you know, because some of those halfway through reforms that uh, get get watered down are actually you know they can be worse. They can really be detrimental. It's really interesting. And the knowledge that you amassed in that period to then tackle a public healthcare system in the UK and it just must have must have been incredibly useful. And so I want to move us on to Healthy IO now and, to, and talk about oh, well, first of all, you've talked about up to the kind of six hundred K seed um raise that you did. Just quickly run us through, could you run us through like maybe like three or four key moments or key decisions that sort of narrate the period between that seed raise and where you are now? And then we can talk about some of the some of the areas that you're involved in now. But yeah, what what are the kind of key moments do you think in that period? Yeah, I think I think the seed succeeding to find the right partner to raise capital with, uh, who is still a, a, a major shareholder in the company and mm. was, you know, point one. Without that, you don't go anywhere, right? You've, you got to find a like-minded, you know, seed investor who can walk through a couple of failures in the first few years. And that costs money. That costs equity, right? Like the decision to structure the company and not optimize for equity, but optimize for uh, the right partners uh, was, was, I would say, decision one. And it turned out in hindsight to be a very important decision. I would say within a year of kicking off decision two, which has been pivotal, was um, partnering with our, with who is now the chief product officer. And, you know, to all for all accounts and purposes, he came in a year, a year in, but is, is my co-founder, right? Uh, Ron Zohar, our chief product officer, getting product right in healthcare. So it's not like healthcare is a play like the, the I would say the health tech graveyard is full of companies that had great, great technologies, but shitty products. You can have a great algorithm, but if it can't deliver uh, itself to the patient in less than a certain amount of money and go through clinical trials, it's useless, mm. right? So we had a great algorithm back then, but how do you how do you wrap it into a kit that every person can do as a home test? That's that's a massive, massive, massive challenge. And then when you do that, you got to do that thinking of the clinical trials. And then you do that, you got to think about how to do it in a cost-effective way so that the NHS can order $14 million worth of that product and seek to bring it to every person in the UK. Massive challenge. Way too big for me. Company would never have succeeded without Ron coming in at that time. It's been since, you know, it's been less than a decade of working together, but so many crises, such an incredible partnership to build. So I think that was kind of point number two. Point three was focus, <laughs> focus, focus. Like there's so much you can do once you get the first patents and kind of Technology seems to be working. You can go this way or the other, and you can go direct to consumer. And you gotta just like if you do your work well, and you and you've strategized well, and if you have your plan and kind of the the redundancy around it in building the team and the cash, you know, just stay focused. Like I'll give you an example. In in when COVID started, 
we've had numerous, we were like, we had 50, 60 million dollars still in the bank from our Series C. We came in very strong to COVID. We had numerous folks call us and say, hey, we know you're on your way to the FDA approval for ACR, album to creatinine ratio, which is our main, you know, our main product out there serving people with diabetes and hypertension and helping them avoid dialysis. Can you scan an antigen test? Can you enable a home, like, so much um, um, noise, some of it to help humanity, some of it, you know, from investors saying, I'll give you $100 million right now if you take your technology and build it in the COVID space, right? So for a couple uh, of months, yes. I had, you know, there was a big pressure on the company to take its core color AI mm. in Persuasion OS. And, and we, we as, a, as, a, as a core team, <laughs> yeah, yeah, as a core team, sat and, and explored this. And, and we, I remember, I'll never forget it. We went back to the board a couple of months later and I had only one slide and it said, it was black, white on black. It said, no FOMO on COVID. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna have a fear of missing out here. And for three reasons. One, it's very hard for us to pick the winner because a lot of the companies were dealing with like uh, uh, microfluidics and this test and through the nose and through the this, da, 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 da. Who knows? Everybody tells you my technology is the best. I do mRNA attachment, blah, blah. I do this. Too many, right? We've spoken to folks from Harvard and Yale and Caltech and Oxford and uh, Max Planck Institute. Like, you know, all the world scientists were kind of on this and said, how do we pick the winner? Very hard. One. Reason two, kind of encapsulated in reason one. Everyone who's anyone in the in in the world is now busy trying to solve for testing for for testing and vaccine for or, or treatment for COVID. In this context, we're a very small company, and we don't like we have our unique like why kind of dive deep into that ocean. That was that was uh, idea two, and and the third was hey we are helping a community which is very big people with diabetes and hypertension. Everybody's looking away from them right now. That's exactly the time to focus on them and serve them at home because they're going to be testing less than before. So if our case in serving people with diabetes ahead of COVID was strong, it is now 100x stronger because everybody's going to be busy with COVID. No one's going to get tested. No one's going to do their preventive work. We make the preventive tests so much more accessible in a COVID environment because you can do it at home with your smartphone, clinical grade. Focus, 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 you know, kind of treat yeah. them, stand by that community that everybody else is turning their back on right now for financial reasons. So I think that was principle three. That was a pointed decision. Call it May, June, 2020. My fourth child was born. I was literally working on that from the hospital after the, after the birth. Um, and we reached this kind of very simple equation, no FOMO on COVID for reason one, two, and three and moved on. So focus. And I guess, I guess the fourth is how to build uh, foster a, a corporate structure and leadership going, going global, UK, US, um, that is really based on tra radical transparency. Uh, you know, we've had to do reductions in force. We were 300 people at some point, like, and thank God and kind of things worked, I think, well for us also on the downturns and the failures. Also when we failed the FDA trials on 16, because risks are always on the table. Now, goes back to my celebration deficiency, right? Because when things really work, we don't celebrate them that well. Because we always have those risks on the table. Like I didn't, you know, I'm not immune to it. Like that's part of my deficiency mm -hmm. as a as a leader. I don't celebrate all the way through, but but when things get tough, it actually serves you well. And this industry is tough. Because if the risks are on the table all the time, when they manifest themselves, people are not like, oh shit, why do we have to do that right now? Yeah. Right? And then you have to manage for that. So I think building a management team, look, we have the same C-level folks for seven years. Mm. Nobody left, right? We've, dealt, we've been dealt some, some pretty tough cards along the way, right? Um, so I think longevity depends on transparency in this business. Mm. Longevity depends on focus, on transparency, on the right investors and very strong alignment there and ultimately doing the right things uh, clinically. Um, that's how we avoided the Theranos and you buy them shit. And that's how you avoid, you know, what's going on in the public market right now by saying, no, it's not the right time to IPO. We may have a great value prop, mm. but you know, it's not good, you know, making some tough decisions and bringing the right leadership at the right time and saying goodbye to certain people, uh, transparency wins. Now, 
Having said all of that, it doesn't mean we're going to win in the long in the long view, right? We're not yet a fully sustainable company that kind of lives off its own cash, and because these things take take long, and and every t- every time around we're, we're, we end up as pioneers. So, you know, you get all that right, it doesn't mean you're going to necessarily succeed. And that's true for all entrepreneurship, by the way. I think also outside of healthcare, just in healthcare, the regulatory piece and kind of time differences and kind of things that could go wrong. Um, especially if you're not Pfizer or Roche and you have this mm, kind of you know, GSK, AstraZeneca, absolutely. you know, you have those fail safe mechanisms, um, mm. you're frail. It reminds me of um, your framework's interesting. It reminds me of uh, a video that I've seen of Rafael Nadal winning the most prestigious junior tournament that exists in Spain. And his in in his interview as a I think he was sixteen or fourteen or something in in that region, obviously coached by his uncle at the time who instilled this in him. He was asked how he felt about his victory, and he said there is nothing about this victory that suggests I'm going to be a successful tennis player. So the work starts again tomorrow. <laughs> and he's just won the most prestigious yeah. junior tournament yeah. in Spain, you know. Yeah. And like, what a mindset that yeah. sent him to twenty two Grand Slams, <laughs> like you know. So fair enough, but. I think what what was interesting about what your decision making as well, particularly around point three, around your COVID focus or or lack thereof to focus on COVID, to focus on everything else except or to focus on what your core value and brand is. It's how it pertains to your brand, your values, your community. That's who and what you were protecting there. And that's ultimately that decision-making that you went through that framework that you've got led you to a place of essentially protecting your brand because your brand was your values and serving those to your community. And then I imagine that once you break that down and you're like, well, what is the value of doing the COVID thing? It's like, well, how does, how does that work? Because our values are this, our community is this, this doesn't meet either of them. And so actually this becomes quite an easy decision in the end of, well, if we're chasing money and we're just chasing a quick buck, then ultimately, who are we helping? What are we really doing? That's not that's not the long arc of entrepreneurship. That's a very short arc, a very short win, and is associated with a very different type of brand, let's say. But it's interesting to me. I, I would say I would say two things about that. I think one is um, there's something to be said about shorter arcs which is fair in entrepreneurship, as long as it's out there and it's known. It's not, it's a short arc to get away and to, you know, get out with the money and screw everybody else, right? If you're building a I business see. that's aimed for, to be acquired in four years, fair enough, have a short-term value. Like if you're saying my company, we're like six scientists out of Oxford, we have this patent on synthetic biology, we're not going to build this all the way through a billion dollar trial. Our goal is a short term, like zero to 350 million exits to Roche. And they'll take it from there, right? It's fair enough. Like I think it's so hard to take it from A to Z in healthcare. It's so hard. I have a lot of sympathy to folks who are saying, we're good at this and we're gonna take that segment and we'll be short term focused and we'll get the exit, phenomenal return on equity. Totally fair, totally like viable strategy, but but trying to just kind of time through a short-term strategy on a long-term arc, that's shitty. And we've seen some companies do that and IPO. And now they're worth a cent on a dollar. And they, and they, they really did a disservice to all of us, right? So, so I think we need to distinguish short-term thinking. Some of it is fair in healthcare. So long as it's aligned with, I'm doing this, that's the segment I'm building the company to serve. And that's how I make a dent mm. in the universe. And, Absolutely. And, you know. Roche will take the dent and make it whatever, right? As opposed to, oh, I need to time it and I'll tell a story mm. when that's what everybody wants to hear. We're, we're in effect, you know, it doesn't scale. And I know it doesn't scale, but it, I need it to scale in the right time. In the, and, you know, I'm not going to name names. You've dealt with those companies in the last few episodes. Uh, they were all, some of them were public and are no longer public because <laughs> they were swimming naked at some point, right? That said, some of the people who were in those IPOs made a lot of money. That mm, is, is bad long-term, and it is, and it also zero solidarity to other companies and to the industry. Mm. But it doesn't mean that short-term thinking that is aligned with your episode in what your drug or device or technology can do, totally legitimate and, and would work really, really well. And, and I, have, I have nothing but, but respect to people who 
take away $200 million off the table, a lot of a $350, $400 million exit, five-year-old company started here, ended here, sold or, and, and then Roche would make it a $4 billion company at a certain probability. But these guys were there and they would, didn't want to play out the next 10 years of being a startup pushing against, you know, whatever. And that's totally fair. I don't know what's your instinct to that, but that's, in my view, totally fair. Yeah, absolutely. Horses for courses. And each each individual circumstances as well will matter in that as well. And you're, and you're absolutely right. You know, if people want to take some money off the table and then keep going, well, fair enough. Others might want to just cash out because they've taken it as far as they can. And I think you and I will both know founder CEOs that just aren't the CEO to take it beyond where it is even, either. And actually to sit back and watch someone else take the helm without any kind of exit event might be a little bit too painful to watch your baby in the hands of another. So actually it might just be worth it from that perspective too. So there's like, there's loads at play there. So, but appreciate, totally appreciate what you're saying. One thing I do want to ask you about though, because one thing that's always fascinated me about your company is, and was your go to market, your NHS focus. That has always fascinated me because there are so many narratives about You'll never make any money. It's not a profitable model. Get the logo and then go abroad. Do a pilot. Make sure it's not a free pilot because there's loads of narratives around the NHS, right? And entrepreneurship towards the NHS and with the NHS and all that sort of stuff. Can you talk about your experience of NHS first, which is, you know, from, from what I've seen, what you did very successfully, and then what, and then your move, I guess, to other markets? Can you talk about that for me? Yeah, so there's a distinction between two product lines. On our wound product, it's NHS first and scale. Um, we're serving clinics, wound clinics, uh, nurses. It's been nothing but an incredible pleasure from point A to where we are today. And we're going to stick to that. And we're going to build an even greater business in the UK, in community, and in chronic wounds. That's sort of a strategy that is there for a long period of time. And, and, and the kind of the experience there has been linear in a good, in a good sense. It's been predictable, linear, transparent. In kidney, I think what happened was we actually had just one and incredible timing. We came into the system. Uh, we believed in NHS when we came in. We didn't know if it's going to be, to your point, like a pilot or whatever. We just believed that for a product that gets early warnings from dialysis, we need a vertically integrated system, right? And NHS made a lot of sense. And, and to be honest, the first employee out of Israel, Catherine Ward, uh, our found, the founder of our business in the UK, um, it ha- a lot of it has to do with her, right? And it's kind of a matter of luck, right? We, we had an incredible leader um, who came in, uh, knew the NHS, who was NHS 15 years, and then almost a decade at Optum, leading, you know, United Healthcare's uh, global yes. work under Optum. So this is a person who'd seen it from both sides, from Bristol, very much kind of knows the system super well and was excited to work on new technology. Like on my on my chart, when I met with the headhunters, when I met like potential candidates, because I decided we were going to the UK, not to the US. And, you know, from, from exactly the reasons you mentioned, she was like my most desired column, but least probable to join. Like, how would you, you know, how would you leave Optum with like 300 employees, infinite budgets, da, 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 into like being number one? outside of Israel. And a lot of our ability to succeed on kidney was how Catherine managed to navigate us and how the intercultural dimension was like massive autonomy on the ground and we follow, which wasn't easy, but that's how we built it. And and her leadership has just been instrumental in that. So I have to say, it's kind of like, you know, uh, you navigate as good as your compass is. So, you know, I can take credit for like how the organization was built well and we knew how to deliver in the UK, which is all true. But at the end of the day, we had we held in our hand probably the best compass out there uh, for doing like you can't succeed in the UK by being a CEO who flies in from Israel or from the US. The UK healthcare is is a business for for British people uh, and not just for any British person, right? So it's a mere few who can do it. Catherine, combined with our value prop, seems to have been a uh, the right fit in a very unique moment in time. When NHS was in a, in a, in a, I would say, 24 month window of, of, um, call it 2018 to 2020 of true global leadership in AI. If you had an AI solution that could scale in the world, the best place to bring it into, I wouldn't say the same thing right now about the, about the NHS 
in that window of 2018 to 2020 was the best place in the world. It was something called AAC, which was like 340 yeah. uh, million pound, I think. Money invested. Yeah, accelerated access collaborative. Real yeah. stuff. This exactly. Uh, NHSX, good people, yeah. good policy. I think it was just stable for two years. So it was the same people. So they could got, get things from point A to B. And, and they were focused on real clinical issues, right? It wasn't like the kind of like saying, oh, we're doing digital. It was meaningful digital interactions. So I think, again, coincidence, whatever. We came in with the best leader, a very strong fit on the product AI side that can meet half a million patients. And that's what they were looking for. And they were very genuinely and well-structured to, to enable that. So I, I can't say what it is like to engage with, with uh, NHS on a challenge like CKD with a digital solution today. I can say what it was like in 2018 to 2020 when you had a Catherine, right, leading your business and there aren't many Catherines out there. So I think it, it's very specific what we were able to do there. I actually say, you know, folks very often come in here into Israel and ask us, how did you do it in the NHS? Is it replicable? Should we? And I can, I really, I want to, can't stress it enough. Jason uh, Keen, who took helm as CEO in, in, in the UK, has been doing a tremendous job. Uh, but that penetration strategy, that ability to like meet the NHS when it's ready, when it has funds, with the right leader in the right clinical area that would be significant for the business outside of a pilot, this was a $14 million budget rollout. You tell me, I think it's, it's like not unique, but it's like a handful of companies were able to do that. And of those handful, probably two were real startups and three were like spin-offs of big companies. So I think it was yeah. a golden era. Yeah. Uh, and I think Catherine was, you know, in the absence of Catherine and then, you know, you can't be a global company to do business in the UK if you don't have that caliber of leadership. And really, I think that caliber of leadership is ultra rare. I love that answer. The reason I like that answer so much is because, well, firstly, I think there's a theme that good people at Healthy IO has, has been a, a really big deal for you guys because you mentioned it a couple of times now. But the other thing is that that approach of local knowledge leading to easier adoption is a very respectful approach it's a very it's it's an approach that leads with listening and understanding and to find someone like Catherine that clearly does that extremely well because obviously has a, a, a knowledge base herself but also will be listening and understanding in order to then adopt something properly because of her connections because of the people that she knows there and because she understands the world it's it's that for me and I think I, I was part of that kind of that generate i was working in the nhs at that time i was at digitalhealth.london and i was doing some stuff at nhs england like i was in and around at that time so i remember that buzz i remember that feeling of this is starting to click and there was a there was a link between us and industry at that point it felt it definitely i i can relate to what you say about that being a kind of golden era of like things were happening then um but to go sort Meaningful. of full circle back to and meaningful things, yeah, things are absolutely very happening. meaningful things. Just meaningful, you know, meaningful things were happening. I think at the end of the day, fundamentally, if you kind of think it about it, I don't want to say philosophically, but like at, at the very foundational level, the currency in which healthcare runs, US, UK, Germany, wherever, Israel, is trust. That is your most coveted, right, coin to trade. Good people are a big chunk of that. Solid science and transparent science is the other part. But trust opens the door. It doesn't get you to scale. And that's, if you, if you want to talk about frustration, you're there in the golden era, you establish trust, you get $14 million, you get evidence like you, that doesn't mean you're going to scale, right? Because after you've been trusted and you've delivered whatever, then it's like, then the second layer opens up and there trust is, is the, is the, precedent to open the door but it doesn't mean anything at that point right so suddenly you know long-term contracts look differently that's the same by the way in the u.s suddenly folks who've transitioned out from when you started two years ago and you've trusted and they trusted you now the new guy is like oh i don't trust anyone who he trusted do you know what i mean so I think, fun, you know, fundamentally, the, the currency you work for, and it's hard. You need to employ a lot of your bandwidth for that 
is to establish trust. Uh, you know, one of our board uh, uh, board uh, meetings when we went beyond a million scans, a million tests, a million, this is a significant number, and you know, it, it 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 has different derivatives. A million scans is such and such cases of dialysis averted, such and such amputations, whatever. And when we finished the slide, I said, and you know, knock on wood, and no cyber attack, and no like leaking of data, like. You know, so many things can go wrong in establishing trust, right? And so I think from that perspective, um, it's, it's, you don't get anywhere without establishing that early on and, think, and getting a sense and understanding, you know, fundamentally that that's the currency you're, you're working on. Um, but it's not enough at the, at the, at the, at the kind of next stage where you want to go beyond 20 million to like 50 to 70 in revenue and also serve bigger populations. I mean, those things are aligned. Um, very hard to do that on trust only. I will say, Kara, you know, one of the best things in our industry, um, if you get it right, the ability to for a bigger organization to be self-motivated, you know, kind of go against the classic Weberian concept of organizational structures and how they just decay and whatever. Uh, the fact that there is one-to-one -one alignment between dollars earned and patients served. Dollars earned and good you spread in the world. In the world, one-to-one, -one, right? Like literally, every test that happens means you know better in the the world is better by one bit that day. Gives you the ability to really drive the business globally in a very decentralized way because people get it, right? You don't have to spend time communicating internally. Oh, uh, we're I don't know we're selling uh, sugar-rated drinks. So actually, we have an inverse relationship between our top line and how good we do in the world, right? Because the more whatever drink we're selling, you know, uh, the higher the odds of the of diabetes. So I need to bullshit all the time to keep everyone, you know, with their eyes on the on, on the ball. But when literally one to one relationship correlation between every dollar we make, every test we have, every scan of a wound, and the world being a better place. You get a self-motivated organization. You'd need to spend almost zero on like what you call brand internal comms and like what is it that we're trying to yeah. do and like get people to join, have access to the best talent. Um, so I think that's you know part of the beauty of doing healthcare and specifically health tech. You know that's in of itself one of the best recurring positive experiences we've had as management. And I heard yesterday as well at a really good event someone was on stage talking about building a resilient team in tough times. And one of the big things was that if you don't have a team aligned to that mission, when things get hard and things get tough, you're going to have people leave. And actually, if you can hire a team where people are attached to the mission, it's not dependent on top down organization and, and uh, you know, that type of structure. Yeah. Incredibly, incredibly yeah. important, incredibly useful. There's definitely been a few themes here today, Jonathan. Like it's, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. People has been a theme. Focus has been a theme. Transparency has been a theme and how all of that combines towards trust. I think what you guys are doing and what you have done, the evidence of how good it is, is how long you've been around and how, how many th waves you've ridden and how many, how many things you've thrived through despite all the punches that have been thrown and you guys continue to grow, deliver value and deliver impact. And it's been, it's been incredible to watch from, from my position anyway, on the, since, since watching your market entry, I went for breakfast with someone on your team when you were entering into the UK. I remember it very well. I can literally picture it now in the Acosta coffee, but anyway, um, yeah, as I say, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. I do want to get you back on. There's a few things I definitely want to talk to you about, about generative AI and things that you're sure. doing in the company as well. Um, maybe I'll get you Great onto pleasure. the Pigeon podcast, which is our other one, but um, you could talk about some of these <laughs> yeah. with you guys. But um, as I say, Yonatan, absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Um, you, if James. people want to learn more about yeah. Healthy IO, they want to learn more about you, what's the best way for them to do so? I think the website, you know, kind of speaks for itself. I'll uh, I'll share some some videos, for, you know, so when you upload, you know, folks can kind of just double click and see the product in action, and awesome. and some folks kind of sharing the, their stories. I think you know, um, it's been a million plus, so folks are sharing the story, and 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 uh, it's better to hear them than than to listen to me. Awesome, appreciate your time. Thank you so much.